Um, and this is Salta, me with the boys in Salta, and my team in Argentina at the moment. I've been lucky to be able to keep my team all through the pandemic, which has not been easy, and it's still not easy, but we are very lucky, and it's an amazing team. We work really well together. It's more of a family than just a team. Um, I live in Buenos Aires. So these are a few pictures of Buenos Aires and where I live. Buenos Aires is a great city to visit because it's a great city to walk around um, and explore on foot uh, or by on bicycles uh, because it's easily accessed. We do a lot of walking here. It's a beautiful city with a lot of European feel. Um, and I find it after living here for well, almost 30 years now, that I still discover different corners of Buenos Aires that I'd never seen before. Um, and the food that we have here is of course beef um, and wine, which is really important to us. For many years, wine was just produced in bulk, but a few years, about 30 years ago now, Europeans started coming to Mendoza to produce wine and they have improved the quality of our wines tremendously and we now export to many places in the world. Um, tango, as you know, is the dance of Buenos Aires. It's easy to see and it's easy to learn how to dance. There's many opportunities for that. And my favorite part of Buenos Aires, which is kind of a secret, is Tigre, which is an hour's drive from Buenos Aires. It's on the delta of the Rio de la Plata. And we um, go there for weekends. You can go boat rowing. You can um, stay a weekend at an island. This is my niece and my son when we went there for a weekend to explore. My son was a baby then. And then the estancias. I actually grew up at an estancia, as I was saying earlier, uh, about an hour's flight south of Buenos Aires. So it's 800 kilometers south of Buenos Aires. But this is an estancia that we host our guest at that is only an hour's drive, three hours drive away from Buenos Aires. And you get to do great horse riding around this estancia uh, or just relax by the pool and have a delicious lunch, you can actually stay at this estancia and spend a couple of nights here before returning home. Mendoza is where I went on my last holidays. I went to Mendoza in February of this year with my boys and my niece. We went um, basically to do a horse ride, but Mendoza is the wine growing capital of Argentina. This is where the Europeans first arrived. This is where we started producing the best wines. This is where they discovered Malbec, that is actually a French wine. And because it, some aspect of the climate of Mendoza just made it a really good wine when in France it was more of a filler wine. Um, and because of Malbec, we became famous world round and more and more money was invested into different kinds of wineries. Uh, Mendoza is probably my favorite place in Argentina to live in. If I could, that's where I would live. The climate is wonderful. It barely ever rains. Your hair goes straight without any kind of products. It's really easy to manage. Uh, and there's a lot of activities you can do here. There's trekking, there's rafting, there's horse riding, there's biking, there's cooking because with wine, food becomes really important. I don't really cook. This is just for the photo. Um, <laughs> And there's great hotels in Mendoza to stay with, great special unique hotels that we can recommend in different areas. And it's probably the destination that has the nicest boutique hotels amongst the wineries. Uh, Aconcagua, the highest mountain in the Americas is located here and you can climb to the top if you want or you can just straight to the base camp. And these are photos of my holiday in uh, February this year. We actually did a five day horse ride up into the Andes, uh, sleeping outside on top of your saddle in a sleeping bag, the, the four nights that we were there. And everything we had was brought, we had to bring with us. There was no car access, no vehicle access. And what is most amazing is the different scenes and sceneries that you see during the ride. All these photos are taken within five days of the different places. You go up on one valley is, is green and full of horses and cattle that they bring up for the summer. 
you go down, you go up, and it's all rocks and stones. You go up, you go down, and it's snowing. The bigger photo here is the border with Chile, this kind of, uh, you can see a little stick in the middle of the photo. That is marks the limit between Chile and Argentina. Uh, so what I like about Mendoza is that, is how much you can be outdoors and how different the scenery is from anywhere else. The Andes here are the highest and the biggest you'll ever see. So they're incredibly beautiful. Then the other wine growing area in Argentina is Salta, the Northwest. The Northwest is very, uh, not very well known within the state, especially Europeans do tend to come to the Salta more often. Um, and it's, uh, the original Argentina settlers, start, uh, the original Argentina actually started here. People would come down from Peru, which was the first European uh, settlement in South America, and they would walk down towards Salta and Jujuy. And these were the, the oldest European buildings, the oldest churches, a lot of Inca traditions as well. Uh, so it's incredibly beautiful to visit. It takes time to visit this part of the country because you've got a lot of small little villages. So you're not just going to one destination. You go to a whole lot of little tiny villages. There's your mountain, Lisa, at the back of the photo down here. Um, so you've got, it takes four or five days to visit and you never, and you kind of stay in one hotel then move to another. And it's also an important wine growing area. As I said, there's Inca ruins uh, and other traditional, other uh, civilizations that lived here. The photo on the bottom left corner is of the Quilmes ruins. This was a group of people that lived here and they actually uh, fought off the Incas. The Incas came and tried to took, take over and they fought them off and they would not be conquered. And then when the Spaniards came, uh, they would not be conquered for many, many years, and then they cut off their water supply. And so they took them in and sent them to Buenos Aires. Uh, but most of the Gilmes people decided they preferred not to live instead of being slaves. So they disappeared within a few years. Uh, these are three Inca mummies that were found up in the mountains, and there's a museum in Salta where you can visit them. They only show one at a time, and the collection of uh, artifacts that were buried with them. It's a typical Inca sacrifice. You find lots of them in Peru, but these are the best preserved mummies that they have found so far. And the museum does a great job of keeping them. Um, it's a beautiful museum. I didn't think I would like it. it. I didn't think it was my thing, but when I got there, it is really well presented and you get kind of emotional because of the story of it. Uh, me and my boys, I thought they would find the Inca ruins to be really, really boring, but they found that trekking up the side of the mountain was great fun. So we spent all day climbing up and down the mountain at the side of it. Um, but the whole place is, is really extraordinary and very beautiful. Uh, and these are the different landscapes you see in Salta um, and Jujuy. It's between the Andes, there's a lot of Atacama feel you get. You get quite a bit of the Atacama feel here, but bigger with larger distances. In Atacama, it's kind of a bit more concentrated, but the same kind of quaint towns, the same kind of uh, geography um, and the salt flats and the deserts. But we have wine as well and llamas to, to go trekking with. There's Dalia Lisa, she sends you her regards. Uh, we sent her llama trekking and she loves to talk about that trip. Biking, the salt flats, as I mentioned, um, and then arts and crafts. To me, it's very important to meet the local people when I visit somewhere um, and get to know what, you know, how they live, what food they eat. Actually go and visit them in their house. And this is actually, these are great craftsmen and they do beautiful pottery, but they also share their experience with us. Um, horse rides, they are beautiful places to go horse riding. I did one quite a few years ago. Again, I love horse riding. So my horse rides tend to be four or five days sleeping in the outdoors. Um, and this is one I did with my kids up in Salta and we stopped at a local home in the middle of the Andes for lunch, uh, which was a really unique experience. Um, so I really, um, 
think Salta is very, very special and it's not on everybody's books. Not a lot of people have heard about it. Um, there's quite a bit of different foods. Salta has the best empanadas. So Karen, if you ask your friend from Bahia Blanca, the best empanadas in Argentina come from this area. Uh, a lot of produce from goats and maize and corn and a lot of the kind of foods that you would find in Peru, but cooked totally different. We are not as good cooks as they are in Peru. And wine. The Salta has the Torrontes. The Torrontes is a white wine. Uh, it's when you smell it, it's very sweet. The scent of the wine is very sweet, but when you drink it, it's a dry wine, which is why they call it El mentiroso, la mentirosa, the liar, because you think you're gonna have drink this really sweet wine and it ends up being really dry to the mouth. Um, but it's good. If it's good, it's really good. If it's not so good, it can be pretty terrible. <laughs> uh, but they are developing a lot of them and it's become really popular in Argentina and they've started exporting it as well. Uh, this is a short video of my favorite bike ride because I'm not a bike rider, I'm a horse rider. So I'm, when I'm bike riding, I actually need large spaces so that I don't bump into anything. And this is a bike ride on the salt flats in Jujuy. That is really, really incredible. Um, it's a bit like Ujuni in Bolivia, but much smaller. But you do get the same thing with the water reflections um, and the same amazing scenery that you get in, in Ujuni, only slightly smaller. Oh, wait, now I need to. There you go. My other favorite destination to visit, as you can see, there'll be a horse, there'll be a lot of horses. I'm sorry, this is about what I love to do. So you'll find a lot of horses. Not everybody loves it, but I do. But it, the destinations are extraordinary, even if you don't like horse riding, you don't need to horse ride. Estero de Libera is our version of the Pantanal in Brazil. It's smaller, but it's this great big water, uh, fresh water uh, area. Uh, it's one of the, I think, five largest, fifth largest freshwater reservation in the world. And Tompkins, who was the owner of Patagonia, he bought a lot of land here and at the end donated it to the Argentine government to build a national park, and they have. And they've got this conservation area that bring back, brings back local animals to the area, like deer, the anteater, uh, and a kind of jaguarete, which is a kind of lion that is typical to this area. So it's an extraordinary place to visit if you're into conservation, because it's really interesting to see. It has a gaucho folklore that is very special and unique because a lot of the work is done with horses in the water, as you can see. Um, the gauchos are very special. They, they ride barefoot. This is a horse ride with uh, people from all around the world. So that's not the local gauchos, but the gauchos will ride barefoot because it doesn't make sense to wear shoes. They'll get wet. Um, and the horse rides are really extraordinary and unique because you're riding in water. Um, they must, they're usually done in our winter because it's just really hot. It's in the north part of Argentina. And as you can see, there are places where the horses swim and you swim with the horses. You hang on to their necks or you hang on to their tails. If you don't want to do that, you have a boat that will escort you, of course but it's, it's really, really special adventure. And another way that you can do it is sit in a boat and be pulled along by a horse. You end up in one of these um, houses, which is where the local people live and you'll have lunch there before you go back. Um, and this is what it looks like. It's like water in the middle of nowhere. And we had a journalist come here once, uh, quite a few years ago, and he did this horse ride. He did a three day horse ride and he said it was the most authentic experience he's ever had meeting the local people and getting to know how their customs and how they live was really, really extraordinary. Bariloche, which is where we went just before the pandemic is our Lake District. It is one of the more popular destinations in Argentina. To me, it's a must see, it's incredibly beautiful. It's the Andes and it's a lot of lakes 
incredibly beautiful lakes with pristine clear water. Um, it's kind of cold, so you jump in and you jump out really fast, but there's an incredible amount of activities and things that we can do. It, there's a lot of trekking, um, easy, simple, to hard, difficult, a few hours to a couple of days, whatever you want. There's all kinds of trekking that can be done in this area. Horse riding, of course. This is an estancia, and there's quite a few estancias in this area that you can stay at. Some of them include fly fishing as well. So if there's any fly fishing fans, uh, it's a great place for families who like fly fishing, but are not the super fanatics that will spend a week just fishing. So if you have a husband who likes fly fishing and the wife wants to do something else, it's a great, Bariloche is a great area for that. It does have great fishing. So it's not like just, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be fishing out of a bucket. Um, this area has a lot of German and Swiss influence, so a lot of chocolate, a lot of beer, a lot of sausages, and it's also the area where we grow uh, berries. The photo on the bottom right corner is a lunch that we had on, on an island. Um, so we took a group there to this island uh, in a boat, and then we took them trekking. And suddenly, in the middle of nowhere, uh, we had set up this restaurant with a sitting room where they could sit down, relax, have a beer, a wine. The beer was actually all in the water in the lake so that they could pick it out from there. And then the sit down table with a tablecloth and wine and all the luxuries and you sit down for lunch. And then a violinist appeared out of nowhere. So half the group was crying because it, it was it was really, really beautiful. Uh, sailboats as well. This is a great experience to do in Bariloche. A lot of what you, we will do here is related to water. So kayaking, rafting, stand-up paddle, um, uh, all that kind of activity. So there's a lot of trekking and a lot of activities in the lake. Uh, so for all of you who are active and really like exploring and spending time there, there's also an option, and I don't have any photos because they actually started it this this past summer season to go glamping in this area. So they set up these beautiful dome tents with a private bathroom and you can spend the night in the middle with surrounded by absolutely nothing. And I think that's the nicest thing Argentina has uh, is that you can still go to places where you see absolutely nobody and you see no city lights, no car lights, no nothing. And this is one of the areas where we can do it. Calafate is another highlight of Argentina. The Perito Moreno Glacier is uh, one of the few glaciers not getting smaller. It used to be growing till a few years ago. Now it's kind of at a standstill, but you can get up really close and personal to the glacier and you can actually go trekking on the glacier if you want. Uh, there's a few treks that you can do. There's a shorter one that's a half day trek and there's a full day trek. There's age limits to who can do it. So the longer one is people under 50. I've missed that one. Um, basically for insurance reasons. It doesn't matter how fit you are if you are over a certain age, because a lot of people in their 70s are far more fit than I will ever be. But uh, it's a case of insurance uh, why you can't do it. But both treks are incredibly beautiful and you're walking on top of a glacier, which is easily access, very accessible. Another option they have here, which I did a couple of times, is this boat where you actually spend a couple of nights on the boat in the lake and um, you go places in this Lago Argentino, which is one of the largest lakes in Argentina, and you stay in places where nobody else goes because you, you can only access it through this boat and not that many boats have a permit to do it. So totally isolated and incredibly beautiful. And it has a few short treks. They're not too long and not too hard, but it's a great experience and the food is to die for. I have no idea why, but the food on this boat is extraordinary. The cabins are small. The showers have really hot water. The beds are comfortable and the windows are huge. So you get to look out at the glacier from your bed. So uh, Calafate is mostly about trek the glacier, of course, and trekking. There's quite a few treks that we can do. And El Chalten, which is the photo you have in your background right now, Lisa, is 
uh, the new kind of fun area in Argentina. Explora, who owns a couple of hotels in Chile, they own one in Patagonia and they own one in Atacama, and they have one in Valle Sagrado in Peru as well, have opened a hotel at El Chalten, which is our trekker capital. So anybody who wants to just spend time trekking on your own, um, you, we of course can provide a guide, but it's a great place to just explore on, on your own. The, park, the walkways are marked um, and the scenery is incredible. There's a whole different uh, selection of treks that you can do from climbing up impossible mountains, which is what um, some people did and the owner of Patagonia did. That's why he named his brand Patagonia to just simple walks that last half a day. These are the domes I was telling you about, Lisa, my friend who built four domes at El Chalten. Each dome has its own private bathroom with hot showers, running water, and then there's another dome for the restaurant. But it's a great place to just take over all four domes for a small group, a family, and you've got the whole area exclusive to yourself. Uh, or for those who let prefer a five-star hotel, Explorer has a hotel now. So this is an area that not many people have visited because until now there really weren't, wasn't a luxury property to stay at. The hotels there were kind of rustic and small. But since we've had Explora and these domes and Aguas Arribas, which is another lodge that um, I don't have photos of, but it's only accessible by boat, is uh, a new destination that's becoming very popular amongst people, especially active people who want to go into Patagonia. This is kind of the, uh, where Patagon the Patagonia brand comes from. Uh, other domes, and this is my son Jeronimo's favorite hotel in the world. He told that to the reception, the manager at the Copacabana Palace in Rio, that he, the Copacabana was his second favorite hotel because this is his favorite hotel. They're actually domes in the middle of nowhere, three hours drive south of Bariloche, and they incl include full board, um, they, each dome has its own private bathroom um, and they've got a restaurant dome with amazing food and a sitting room as well. And they include horse rides, biking and trekking that is amazing. And they're also looking into opening up in the win winter season for people who want to go there and visit. This property has 11 domes. So it's all and it's very, very isolated. You need to get there in a four by four vehicle. So it is really special and a great destination to completely escape from the madding crowd. Uh, and then one of my, probably my favorite destinations, not where I would, I would live in Mendoza, but this is, I really, really love because it's south of where I come from. So it's the Atlantic Patagonia, which is a desert. You can look over the ocean and you know, it's how it's flat and you can see as far as the horizon goes. In this part of Patagonia, you can look over the land and it's exactly the same. It's flat, there's nothing there, and you can see as far as your eyesight will see. A friend of mine said it was kind of scary because he thought God could see everything he was thinking. Uh, but I love it, that's where I come from. And in Peninsula Valdez, Madrin is where we have the right whales come and breed. So it's a great destination for people who are into wildlife and nature. Uh, and you can see killer whales, you can see the right whales, um, you can, there's a lot of sea lions, sea elephants, and penguins, Magasanic penguins, we have the biggest continental uh, colony of Magasanic penguins, and we can do activities such as diving with the sea lions, or snorkeling with them, and you, they say you're not supposed to touch them, but they actually come, they're like Labrador dogs, they come up to you, and they want to see you and smell you and find out what exactly it is that you are. And they're really friendly and it's not dangerous at all. Um, I've had family who've done it and they, it was once in a lifetime experience, totally unforgettable. Horse rides, of course, this is me. So I've got to put a horse in everywhere. Um, kayaking in close to the beach where amongst the sea lions, sometimes you get whales swimming kind of in the area but not that close to where you are, but it's just a question of luck. Um, and this is a short video to end the presentation.
Okay. All right. Well, something that will be good, I'm sure. So. That's what Lisa, we've never seen Lisa Marie. There she is. There you go. That's my Argentina. That's what I love about Argentina. Any questions, anything you'd like to know? I noticed that there was on the mountains, there were a lot of striation and different colors, especially the, the rust color. What would that um, element be? And is there mining there? You referenced the lithium fields in Bolivia. Uh, the lithium is not in the areas that I presented. The lithium is more in Catamarca, although there is some in the salt flats that I showed. But yes, we actually have one of the, I think it's the second largest, uh, the Bolivia, Northern Argentina and uh, Northern Chile have one of the biggest areas for lithium in the second largest area in the world. It's this big area with different places. Um, the colors that you see do happen mostly in the north part of Argentina, so Salta, Jujuy, Catamarca. I don't know exactly what the different colors are, what the minerals are, but there is quite a bit of mining there. It is something, um, it is kind of complex because mining can be very damaging in a country with, um, where laws can be broken if you are big enough. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a push, but there is quite a bit of mining happening in Salta in that area. I would think offhand it was, is copper. It looked very much like some of the Mexican. Yeah, pr probably because Bolivia had quite a bit, it has quite a bit of copper as well. And it's close to that, to Bolivia. So yes, it might be. I'm afraid I'm no miner. I have no idea. Sorry. I have a question and Veronica, thank you for this wonderful journey and Lisa Marie, this is just beautiful. beautiful. Um, help me with best times of year to visit. Best times of year to me, it's March, April, cause it's our fall, especially if you're going to Patagonia. It's incredible. The colors down in Patagonia is a bit like New England in the States. It's truly beautiful. All right. um, how about Salta? Depends. Oh, sorry. Salta, yeah, no, that's that, and I was going there. Salta is best to visit in our winter, which it would be in your summer. So June, July, uh, May, uh, all the way through to September. Because in summer, it get, you can still visit it in summer. And a lot of people do. Mostly tourists coming to Argentina will come within during our summer, uh, which is your winter. So November through to March is when most people would come. Uh, but the, the Estero de Liberá, the waterlands, Salta and Jujuy, Iguazú Falls, which I didn't show, sorry, um, which is incredibly beautiful, are destinations that are um, more, um, are not so hot during our winter. So uh, greater, best to visit in May, June, or September, October. Thank you. Um, and for Patagonia, definitely our summer. Just stunning. Um, if anybody has any more questions, I, I do want to point out a couple of things that a girlfriend of mine who is very into wine sent me today because she knew that I didn't have a wine expert. And so she gave me some fun facts <laughs> and uh, I thought I would share them. So the first thing about Malbec is that it is very healthy. <laughs> there are studies that say, of course, drinking red wine in moderation provides health benefits, but Malbec is the healthiest wine second only to Pinot Noir. So, salut, okay. Uh, <laughs> second, um, Malbec has four times more antioxidants than Merlot. See how good this is? Um, it has two times more <laughs> antioxidants than Cabernet Sauvignon. And a little bit of history, you mentioned a little bit about the French grapes. And so Michel uh, Pouget was a renowned French uh, ampelographer. Did anyone know that name? I never heard that before. Ampelographer. Um, and he's the one who actually brought over the French vines and brought them. He was, he was on a mission to help the Chilean 
uh, wines prosper. And I guess there was a mayor um, who from Argentina that was over in Chile and he said, oh, you've got to come and do it here. So that's how they started the wines in Mendoza. But anyway, I just thought that was, um, it, it, uh, just a couple more things. Uh, it's Mendoza is home to 75% of Argentina's vineyards. Mm -hmm. uh, Malbec is the region's most celebrated grape. Uh, Mendoza has one of the most intense wine climates of the world. So this is what, what you were saying, Veronica, about it's really special because it's so high. It's 3,000 to 4,000 feet above sea level. And that the Andes Mountains, they block the rain. So these particular grapes are so happy. As you said, it was, it was very dry. They have 300 days of sunlight. I, I think I'm going to move to Mendoza. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then it can be quite hot. And it ripes, rap, ripe, uh, ripens rapidly, but then at night it gets very cold and it stops the ripening proce process. So it really has a wonderful uh, combination of ripening during the day and then not ripening and stopping at night. So anyway, I just thought that was fun since I love wine, you know, and I think... Yeah, another thing about wines in Mendoza is we irrigate. I know in France, you're not supposed to water the grapes. In Mendoza, we have to. Nothing would grow without water. And as you said, because they are high up, the temp difference in temperature between daytime and nighttime is pretty extreme. When we were up camping at, on the horse ride, one of the nights I was there, I, when I woke up in the morning, I went to see my niece and she had this whole frozen frost all over her sleeping bag. She was fine inside a sleeping bag, but it, at night, and it was midsummer. I mean, February is the hottest month for us. Um, and it, it gets really, really cold at night, uh, which makes it really nice because it cools down. In Buenos Aires, it's hot all day and I cannot wait for summer to be over. We feel that way in South Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So um, how else would you get around if you didn't horseback ride? Like how could somebody participate in all of these wonderful places? Uh, you're not gonna go on a bike ride that long or can you? I mean, would it be possible to mountain bike everywhere that a course goes? Probably not. No, no, no. And we don't do that much biking. I mean, it's not a country that does that much biking, but we there is a lot of hiking, a lot of walking. Um, and as I said, from simple half day treks that include a picnic at the end, so are very easy to do, to full day trekking and even a couple of days uh, into the mountains, sleeping outdoors. There's quite a few options for trekking in in Argentina in all different areas. So um, trekking is is a great way. And then when uh, when exploring, a lot of people just drive from one place to another. And we all can also arrange self drive. So in some parts of the country, self drive is a great way to visit, especially the northwest, the Salta area, where you've got all these small quaint villages. You just book the hotels you want to stay in and then drive at your own pace from one destination to another because the drive itself is an exploration of the different areas, the people that live there. Um, so that is an option. It's not so much an option in Patagonia because the roads are bad and uh, kind of scary. It, it can be done if you're an adventure driver, but in the Northwest, yes, definitely self-driving. Because of the distance, Argentina is big. It's not as big as the States, but it is big. So if you're going from one place to another, if you're going from Salta to Mendoza, you would need to fly because otherwise it would be a day and a half driving. So you would need to fly. It's two and a half, two and a half hours flight. And we have connections from Salta, from Mendoza to Salta to Iguazú. There's connections from Bariloche to Calafate. But a lot of the times you would need to fly. Otherwise, you'd be spending a lot of time just in transit. I would imagine there's not a lot of street signs either. So how does one get figure it but out? We have, we have street signs. It's just very confusing. Okay. Yes. You've <laughs> they'll probably point you in the wrong direction. And they are all in Spanish as well. Oh. Um, but yes. Um, well, the thing is with technology now, with all the different gadgets that we have in our phones, you can get anywhere, basically. Even I can go in the right direction, and I'm always going off in the wrong direction, even with my phone. So um, there's quite, it's so much easier now. Traveling around is so much simpler than, than it used to be. How long do you recommend to see Buenos Aires, Mendoza, Salta, and Bariloche? You want to visit all four destinations? I would do a fortnight, two weeks. 
to actually spend time. I would do three nights in uh, Mendoza, Bariloche, and Buenos Aires, and then four nights in Salta. Uh, three nights each, I mean, not. And then four nights in the Salta area, visiting the wine area. Um, so yeah, I would say at least two weeks to visit the, the four destinations. What about in the Patagonia and El Calafate area? I mean, how long would you do? I did a honeymoon for two weeks for, for young people who just thought it was the best thing in the whole world that they'd ever done was their honeymoon trekking all over the place. And they thought that was just heaven. But what would you recommend to? Yeah, no, two weeks, a week and a half, two weeks is, yeah. is good. Uh, Patagonia has quite a few different options. You've got Calafate and El Chalten in Argentina. You've got Torres del Paine on the Chilean side. Mm -hmm. And they actually combine, if you combine yeah. both sides, they combine really well. And um, you're not visit it's not the same. It's different because, as you said, the water hits the Andes on the Chilean side and doesn't get across to the Argentine. Even down there, the scenery is completely different and the activities are different. And then you add, you've got three days or four days. You've got about a week in those two areas. So, uh, and then you add Ida Bariloche or Ushuaia, and you've got another three or four days. So about, and then if you add Buenos Aires or Santiago as the entry city, you've got two weeks definitely easily to really get to see it. Do you recommend anyone going to Ushuaia without going on Argentine, uh, sorry, an Antarctic cruise? <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, yes definitely. Um, it, it has been for many, many years seen as the portway to um, Antarctica, as you said, but they've built amazing hotels and it's, it's a unique place in the world to actually spend some time. They've got an amazing national park with activities that you can do trekking, uh, kayaking in the national park. You've got activities on the Beagle Channel. You can fish your own sintosha, which is crab fish. I think the big crabs that are like lobsters, but really, really good. You can fish those in the Beagle Channel and then go, go back to the restaurant and eat them there. Um, we've got helicopter rides. It's got one of the best ski resorts in Argentina at the moment, Ushuaia. So if you like skiing and want to ski in your summer, that is a great destination to come to. And a lot has happened in Ushuaia in the last uh, few years. So yes, definitely a great place. And also it has some fly fishing lodges that are extraordinary in the middle of nowhere uh, for fish, you know, people who love fishing. I don't know what the name for that is. How many days do you recommend for a horseback riding trip and where? I would recommend the rest of my life for a horse bike riding trip, but it depends on how much you like um, horseback riding. Uh, the one we did to Mendoza was really, really beautiful, but it doesn't, because you're in the Andes, it didn't include galloping. A lot of it was just walking through the mountains. So you keep going up and down. The horse rides in Salta are pretty similar. There's a lot of rocks and a lot of mountains, but there are places in Cordoba, for example, where uh, you could do horse rides for three days and there you do get to gallop um, and canter and it's a bit more flat, although incredibly beautiful as well. Uh, and then uh, there are horse rides in the Bariloche in the lake area as well. It depends on how much you like horse riding. I, the one I did to Mendoza was five days. The last day was hard. There were 17 of us doing the, the ride. Uh, most of us knew how to ride and rode well, but there was a few who hadn't and they still enjoyed all five days. They thought it was, it was perfect. So uh, the not bathing for five days, that was kind of, I mean, they were uh, rivers, small rivers that you could wash in, but after five days, it kind of, you missed a shower. Uh, but other than that, it depends on how much you like it. So three, five days, whatever you, you find more fun. The, the thing about the horse rides in the Mendoza Salta ones is that you're really going where nobody's, where you think nobody's been before. They have been because they've been set up. But I remember coming down from the mountains after five days and we saw a car with people in, in it. And we were like, wow, a car. We hadn't seen anything, no other person for five days. So it was like, oh, that's strange. There's people in the world. It was like 
it's all disappeared and it hadn't. I wanted to ask um, if you have clients that let's say they're not as active, um, although they love the scenery, they would prefer to maybe stay uh, a, a bit more civilized, nice hotel, you know, in a yeah. nice hotel. Uh, what would you recommend? What kind of an itinerary? I would do Buenos Aires, Mendoza, Bariloche, because uh, they have beautiful hotels at, at these destinations. Calafate has Eolo, which is a beautiful property. Um, and El Chalten with Explorer now is an option that wasn't there before. But if, if you want something more relaxed, laid back, good food, good wine, a bit of walking, a boat ride to a private island, then I would do Buenos Aires, Mendoza, and Bariloche. Wonderful. Anyone else? Any other questions? No? Uh, hi, this is Roxana. I can't really put my video on. I'm, I'm driving. I'm oh, taking okay. you along for a ride. <laughs> but I wanted to thank you, Veronica, because it was absolutely wonderful and very inspiring and very exciting. And it just makes you want to travel as soon <laughs> as possible. Um, I just wanted to know, uh, I know, I, I just heard actually today that Argentina is closing their borders uh, to flights from certain destinations. Uh, what is the current situation with COVID vaccination? And realistically speaking, when do you expect that we would be able to travel again for pleasure? You know, maybe one year, maybe more. What is your, your personal opinion? That's a great question. Um, the borders have been closed for, uh, since March in last year. So we've been closed for a year, over a year now. Uh, the only people who were allowed to come to Argentina were actually Argentine residents. So Argentines did leave the country, go to the States, go to Mexico, and then come back. Or business people coming because they had work to do in Argentina, their borders open for them. Other than that, the borders have been closed. What they have done is uh, when the UK had the big peak in COVID, they canceled all flights from the UK. Uh, it was not that many flights. It was only um, the British airline. And now this week they've canceled flights from Brazil, Chile and Mexico uh, because of the peaks in these countries. Although Chile is doing a great job vaccinating and so is Brazil. Um, Argentina is vaccinating. We are vaccinating slower than uh, Brazil and Chile, but we are vaccinating at a steady pace. So although slow, we'll get there. Uh, before the peak in Brazil and Chile, uh, the idea was to open it for the winter holidays. Most, the pe most of the people who come to Argentina are Brazilians that come skiing. So with the peak in Brazil, mm. we're waiting to see what happens with that. It's very much day to day working out what's happening in the rest of the world, what's happening in Argentina. Uh, and we have had this week a slight raise in the number of cases in Argentina. Our hospitals are not overcrowded. We do have space in the hospitals, which is my main concern with any, kind, with any peak. Um, so we don't have a dangerous peak, but we're going into winter. It's the fall, fall has started in Argentina, so we're going into winter, and that is when you usually see a raise in cases. What the government is, the government is not saying anything at all. But what I've been hearing through the grapevine and because as travel agents doing inbound travel, we have been pushing for about six months now, or not since the beginning, but for about six months now, we have been pushing for them to set a date. And the date they are talking about is October, which is when our winter is over and we're going back into summer and the beginning of the high season for us but they are honestly looking at this day by day seeing what happens around the world seeing how vaccination happens um, and seeing what happens to the countries that surround us because being right next door to brazil there's a lot of um, contact centers between brazil there's a lot of places where we connect and where people cross the borders because they actually iwasu i mean is an example 
one of you had to get a visa to get in, but if you're Argentine or Brazilian, you go across the border very easily at, at quite a few points. So we're basically waiting to see what happens. At the moment, the feel that I have because of my conversations with the government and my pushing for an opening date is sometime in October, hopefully. Great, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Roxy. That's wonderful, Veronica. Anyone else? Well, we just thank you so much for joining us no, in our home. Thank you. It really is lovely. It was fun. It was so much fun. I enjoyed doing it. Thank you, Lisa. It I'm very so inspired. Fun. Now I need to go. <laughs> whenever, whenever you're ready. As soon as we open borders, I'll let you know. We thank all need you. to go. Yeah, <laughs> I'll let you yeah, all know. A forced back riding <laughs> track for five days. <laughs> thank you so much, Veronica. And anybody else, any other questions? No? Okay. No, well, it's wonderful. Thank you, thank you for this wonderful. evening escape. It's really great. Wonderful. Thank you. So beautiful. Incredibly beautiful. And uh, well, thank you all for coming. And uh, on April 21st, we're going to go to New Zealand. So, wonderful. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Liz Marie. Thank you, Veronica. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bye. Thank you. Bye.